God is good. And all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever heard that before. That's kind of one of those uh, Christianisms, you know, when you say, God is good, and you respond, all the time. And all the time. God is good. And do we think that? Do we believe that? Because sometimes we get caught up in isms and we don't think about what we're saying. Sometimes we get caught up in the lyrics of the song and maybe we're not thinking about what the song's saying. Sometimes we get caught up in church and we're not thinking about who our God is. But God really is good. All of the time. All of the time. We have an amazing God. And, and we, we sing the song, How Great Is Our God. And it's kind of worded like a question, but that's not a question. That's a statement. Our God is great. And, and we think about the words of that song. It says, The splendor of a king clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. All the earth. Not just people, but the plants and the mountains and the rivers. And all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. You have a God who wraps himself in light and, and darkness hides. Our God. And he trembles at his voice. Darkness trembles at his voice. I mean, how great is our God? I, I, you can't put words to the, to, to the majesty of our God and how wonderful he is. It says, age to age he stands, time is in his hands, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, the Father, Spirit, and the Son. He's a lion and he's a lamb. He's a name above all names. He's worthy of our praise. And like the song sings, he's worthy of our praise. But we lift him up. He is worthy of our praise. He is amazing. We sing about amazing grace, but do we really understand that grace is amazing? that our God gives us. That we glorify His name. We, 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 we gather together because this God that we serve is, is inexplicable. He is so wonderful and inexplicable. That should not give us the excuse, though, of not trying to explain Him because He's, he's oh so majestic, oh so beautiful. And, and, you know, I get caught up. I, I, I like the preview, though, and, uh, and for the Truth Project. He said, the God of the universe, this amazing God, this, this wonderful God, this, this almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, holy God dwells inside of me. Wow. I mean, can we grasp that? Can we rejoice in that? Can we praise in that? Can we just revel in that? The beauty of that. I, um, I went to a, a Catalyst last year and Francis Chan was speaking and, and Gunger. Y'all heard of Gunger? How many people have heard of Gunger? I didn't think a lot because it's like a, a really, Gunger's like a, uh, the really uh, a, a popular Christian group for the, the teenagers or the younger the younger crowd, and we're not the younger crowd. Most of us, so <laughs> some of us are, some of us are, you know. But that's good. But Gungers, I mean, they're an awesome band. They're playing, you know. They get up there and they're playing, and the whole stadium is just worshiping. And then they get done, and Francis Chan walks up on stage and he says, "Hey, how about that Gunger?" And the crowd goes wild. Yes. He said, hey, how about Jesus? And, and they go wild. Yes. And if anything, just a little bit less. He's like, we can't do that. Gunger and Jesus are not on the same level. <laughs> and so oftentimes we do that. I went out in my yard the other day and I was pulling some weeds and, and I saw this spider. It's like yay big, huge spider. And it was beautiful. It had these beautiful black and yellow markings on it. And it had this beautiful web with this zigzag on it. And I took pictures of it. And then I wanted to go in and tell my wife a July about it. And, and, and told my daughter about it. And, you know, it, it, it was cool. I wanted to tell people about that. But it's a spider. 
You know, do I get excited about going and telling people about Jesus the same way that I did about this spider? Or do I get as excited about Jesus as I would about Gunger singing at this conference? Or do I get as, as excited about Jesus as I do sporting events or, or anything else in this world? Does Jesus touch us the way that anybody or anything in this world does? That is a, a, a conviction on me, and I, and I dare to say on most of us. This is our, our God. Our God that we're talking about. Let's, let's pray before we go any further. Our dear Father in heaven, we, oh, we praise you. We thank you for who you are. And Lord, if we don't know who you are, we thank you that you brought us here this morning just to give us a, a step closer to knowing who you are, to give us a glimpse uh, more of, of who you are. And, and Lord, you've gone before us. Every one of us, no matter where we are in our life, you've gone before us in our life. You know where we are headed. And you have paved the way. Your grace has laid out a, a way for us to follow. And, and Lord, I just pray that our eyes are open to that that we can draw closer to you, understand you more, know you. Your word tells us that eternal life is knowing you. So we, I pray that we can just grasp that a little more this morning. Draw closer, know you better, and, and, and just rejoice in that. Lord, I pray your words this morning. Your words be heard. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been talking this year, and we've really been trying to focus on going beyond our four walls. Taking our faith outside of these four walls, because we'll gather together, and again, we'll sing about the praises of God, and, and first of all, we need to make sure that we're paying attention. What are we saying when we say this, and do we really mean it? And if we really mean it, then, then I mean, I, I, I am a terrible, terrible, terrible singer. But if we're praising our God, then it shouldn't matter. I mean, I might chase some of you out of here if you hear me praising God, but, but it's, God is so great, none of that should matter. We should be raising our voices and praising Him. But, but when we step outside of our four walls, do we have that same idea, that same attitude, that same spirit? Uh, because so oftentimes, if we step outside of the four walls, then, then we begin to clam up, especially about God and Jesus. Now, if I went out and I had a great meal, I want to share that with people. And even if it was a, a, a deep fried, unhealthy meal, I would go out and I would share that with people. Right? We'd, yeah. Yeah, some, some fried pork chops or something like that. We'd go, hey man, they were good stuff. Well, that's not good for you, but we don't care. We'll, we'll share it. But we got God that we can share with people. We want to take Him outside of these four walls. And you know, the word for that is evangelism. And evangelism so oftentimes creates just a negative idea in people's mind because they, they picture somebody knocking on the door or somebody being very uh, brash and abrupt. And, 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 uh, and, and so it, it has this negative connotation sometimes, unfortunately. But evangelism is really just a Greek word. It means good news. Good news. Hey, I've got some good news for you. How many of us don't love sharing good news? I love to share good news. And, and so we ask, ask ourselves, if it's about the best news in all of history, are we that excited to share it? We want to talk about evangelism this morning, and a lot of this needs to be self-evaluation. It's like, okay, oh, what am I doing? Am I doing this? What could I do differently? Uh, and, and ask some questions. And good news, sometimes we, we understand that good news is not always uh, quite as understandable until we understand what the bad news is. In order for the good news to be really good news, we have to understand the bad news that is on the other side of that. In other words, uh, a sunny day is a much prettier day after a week of storms. Right? Um, you know, and if, if you're going out and you're telling, hey, some, it's going to be 70 degrees a day, after a week when it was like 30 below, 70 is great news. The word cure takes on an entirely, entirely different meaning if you're the one with the disease. Relief is abundantly welcome when you're the one in pain. 
uh, directions are, are, are great if you're lost. Unless you're a guy sometimes, but... And that's, uh, that's what evangelism is. Evangelism is about sharing the message of Jesus Christ. It's about telling the good news of Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done for us. And, and here's what evangelism is not. Evangelism is not a checklist. Evangelism is not a competition. Evangelism is not a, a tally sheet where you're marking off people that you get to say the sinner's prayer. That is not what evangelism is. It's not uh, the opportunity to shove a message, no matter how good it is, down somebody's throat who doesn't want it. Uh, I heard about a woman who sat on a bus came, and she gets her Bible out and she sits next to this guy and she says, Hey, can I share with you the message of Jesus? And she, he says, No. And she opened her Bible and did it anyway. How beautiful is Jesus if that's how he's being shoved into your face? Evangelism is simply the news about this inexplicably great God that we have. This beautiful God that we have. This glorious and holy and perfect and awesome and mighty God that we have. This God who is full and not just full of love. This God who is love. That's evangelism. That's telling people about this God that we, we serve. The only God that there is. And, and you know, God sent His only Son... God so loved the world that He sent His only Son. I mean, that's the good news right there. And, and if we're not taking the message out in that context of love, because God sent His Son, He left His throne, He came to a, a manger in the context of love. And if we're not taking that message in the context of love, then we're doing a great disservice to it. A grave disservice we have to carry out this message of God in love. Again, this isn't a contest. It's not a scoreboard. It's not to be driven by numbers. Here's, I don't know a whole lot for certain. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty simple. And, and uh, I, I completely uh, I agree with Paul when Paul says, Hey, listen, I, I preach the gospel. And other than that, I'm kind of a, I don't know a whole lot. All right? But here's one thing I know for certain. Everybody has a need in their life. Everybody. It doesn't exclude anyone in the world. Every person has a need in their life. Every single person in this world is broken. Every single person in this world has uh, pain and hurts and needs and they're broken. And, and if you picture them like this, this, this clay pot and they're, and they're, they're, they're cracked... And, and this darkness and this pain just oozes through the cracks. And there's not a single person on this planet who's excluded from that idea. Every one of us has something that is just hurting us and, and, and a need that we have. And we're in pain. Now maybe we can't define it with a word. Maybe you can't say, oh, hey, let me pinpoint it and this is what it is. But we all know it. We all feel it. And, and maybe some of us don't even want to admit it, but we all feel it. The other thing that I know for certain, and these are maybe the only two things I know for certain. The other thing I know for certain, God can meet those needs. Every person in the world has needs, and God can meet those needs. And He's the only one who can meet every one of those needs. You know, and it, it doesn't mean that we now become these perfect vessels. What it means is now, as cracked vessels, with God residing in us, this God who wraps himself in light, instead of darkness oozing out of our brokenness, we have light oozing out of our brokenness. Okay, it doesn't mean we have to be perfect after this. It means that we allow God to flow through us. And in and, and our broken spots, people can say, I can see the glory of God in that. And so, I, again, every person has needs, and God can fill those needs. I, as an officer... Um, told the story years ago, but it, it, it bears repeating. And, and I was driving uh, with uh, my partner. We were over, it was early in the morning, and I was over in the Clifton area. And, and this woman stumbles out into the street, obviously drunk. And she's waving us down. And we stop, and, 
and she's a prostitute. And she's, she's asking, she's like, I just need a ride home. I just need a ride home. And she lived in Over the Rhine. So we said, okay. And so we, we let her get in the back seat of the car and on the way to the Over the Rhine, taking her home, and I asked her, I said, hey, tell me, what do you know about God? And this prostitute, without missing a beat, she goes straight to forgiveness. She says, I know that God forgives. I know that God forgives. This woman had a brokenness and a need in her and she knew what she wanted more than anything else was forgiveness and she knew that God offered that to her. That's all she knew about God, but that's what she, she, she clung to that. She knew that God could meet that need for her. So on the rest of the way down to over the Rhine, we're telling her, you know what, you're absolutely right in the way that he can forgive you, in the way that he forgives you is through his son Jesus Christ, and, and you can accept that. And she sat in our car, and we prayed with her, and we get down to over the Rhine, and this drunk prostitute is standing in the middle of over the Rhine, hugging two police officers. <laughs> I'm sure it looked like a very odd scene, but man, it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful that this woman who was broken and had a need and, and she knew that God could fill that and she just needed uh, the information. How, do, how does that happen? She needed that information. We have one Jesus. There's one God. There's one truth. And, and it's universal. And here's the difference between our needs. We have a universal need that God can meet. But every one of our needs could be different. Every one of our needs could be something different. Just as language is diverse, but it's all used to convey similar messages, the needs that people have are diverse, but they're all addressed by one Jesus. Where's the need? Where's the pain? Where's the confusion? If you don't start your evangelism or you're presenting the truth and the beauty of God with those questions, then you're off track. If you don't start with where is the need and where are people broken, then you're shoving a message at people who aren't ready to accept it. The gospel of Jesus Christ will meet the true need of every single person. And here's what we need to understand is when we start looking at the gospel, what it offers, because sometimes we get, we get I've seen evangelism courses that, that teach you the Romans road, which is absolutely beautiful and necessary and wonderful. But if that's how you come at pers every person the same way, saying the same thing with the same words, then, then you're missing the point because there's people on the other side of that message. And, and the needs that, that this one gospel meets, it gives victory. People who are in desperate need of victory, who, who have fail, felt like failures their whole life, it gives victory to those, those people. It gives forgiveness, just like the prostitute knew. She, has, she was doing things that she needed forgiveness for. The gospel offers forgiveness. It offers redemption. People who, who want to to be something different than what they were. It, it gives them redemption, the, this message of, of Christ. Jesus Christ offers a new beginning. It tells us we're new creations when we accept Jesus. It offers peace. And there's people, a whole lot of people in this world that the one thing that they want and need is peace. Soul peace. That was so sad. Oh, I really don't have time to go on. Peace is such a huge need in this world. And, and, and the gospel of Jesus Christ offers peace. It offers comfort. It offers love. It offers healing. It offers understanding. Understanding of life that until I, I accepted Jesus Christ, I didn't understand life. But, but Jesus Christ brought it all into focus. It offers relationship. And we are a world that is in desperate need of relationship. It offers power. We have power to do things. We, we have the power to defeat death with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have power to defeat sin with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have freedom. And so much more. So much more. Paul, the apostle Paul, was considered the greatest evangelist, evangelist that ever lived. And it's because that he talked to people and he figured out who they were before he started throwing a message at them. To the Jews, he came to them and he said, Listen, let me, let me tell you about our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let me tell you about when we were led out of Egypt. And he talked to them in ways that they understood. And he talked to them in terms of law and how Jesus gives them freedom 
and fulfills that. To the Gentiles on, on, uh, on Mars Hill, when he goes there and he kind of walked around and he noticed that there's one statue of an unnamed God. And, and because they're so scared, they worship so many gods, they were scared of leaving one out. And so they just have the statue of an unnamed God just to make sure they don't leave anybody out. And so Paul starts, he says, hey, let me tell you about this God. This is the only true God. And these are people, philosophers, who are wondering, well, where does it all begin? How did this all start? Where did we all come from? And that's exactly where Paul went. Let me tell you about this God and how he made everything. It comes from this one God. When he's talking to Timothy, Timothy's a, 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 a young pastor. And he's worried because he's young. And he's telling Timothy, hey, God didn't give you a spirit of fear. He gave you power. He addressed his need. Paul evangelized and sat in prison a lot because he evangelized. We're worried about somebody snickering at us or saying no, but Paul got beat and was in prison for giving out this message. And when he sat in prison, he didn't stop because you sit in prison and the despair in prison, and what did he do? What was his way of evangelizing to them? He sang songs of praise to God, lifted the spirits of those who were in prison. He knew who he was with. He shared the message. Thessalonians, he talked about perseverance. He talked about a future. To the Corinthians, he talked about uh, uh, sin and overcoming sin and immorality. And, and he says in 1 Corinthians, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, though not being without law, the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. I understood who I was talking to. I, I understood that these were people that I was talking to who have needs. And God can meet those needs. Blaise Pascal said that we all have this God-shaped vacuum inside of us. Only God can fill it. Your, your vacuum might, might look a little different than somebody's next to you, but God is the only one who can fill it. The need of every human being is universal, but it's not identical. And that's the thing, we have, to, we have to care about the people who are on the other side of the message. We have to care about, about who they are. That they're, that they're human beings with their own lives and their own problems and their own worries and concerns and brokenness and pain and scars. And, and then we need to say that, that Jesus addresses that. Jesus fulfills those needs. We talk about Jesus being a relationship. This is the big talk now in, in, in church. It's a relationship, it's not a religion. And yet sometimes we refuse to relate. If we're, if we're touting a relationship with our Maker, then we need to relate to people to portray that message. We have uh, so many motivations for, for evangelism, so many motivations to share this good news, you know, and not, least of which is the fact that there are eternal souls in every human being. Eternal souls, and without this good news, without this message, then those eternal souls are, are in danger of spending an eternity in a very real hell. Eternal souls. Now, I know that we, we begin because we sit and we sometimes we, we start with the objections. I'm going to say, well, I'm not very good at that. And I'm going to tell you about this guy. And his name was Jonah. This was in the Bible that I grew up with. I loved this picture as a kid. But Jonah was this guy and he's walking around and he's living back in the time when uh, he's an Israelite and, and God comes and he says, hey listen, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach a word to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Assyria is the nation that is destroying Israel, coming against them, wanting to, to overpower them and destroy them. So Jonah is standing here and God says, go to Nineveh 
and tell them about me. Jonah's thinking, I hate them. So I'm going to go this way. And as Jonah goes this way, then uh, the circumstances lead to the fact that a fish swallows Jonah and takes him back to where God told him to go. So he ends up in Nineveh. Now here we have a reluctant prophet. Doesn't want to save these people. Doesn't want them saved. And so he walks through the streets of Nineveh finally. And here's his whole message. So he says to Nineveh, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. There, I did it. That's all he says. He doesn't give the Romans road. He doesn't walk them through scripture. He says, forty days, you're going to be overthrown. And now, keep in mind, this Assyrian nation who is, who is just running through the world, destroying, they understand overthrown. They understand their need. And it doesn't matter one bit how much Jonah explains it or doesn't explain it because it's God's message, it's not Jonah's. And if, and if Jonah is, is obedient and says it, then God will plant it and grow it. And so Jonah said it, and the Ninevites, they repented. Jonah was not too happy, but that's irrelevant. The Ninevites repented. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you think you're good at it or not, or if it's your gift or not. It's God's message. It's not yours. Every single person sitting in this room can evangelize about Jesus Christ, can give the good news of Jesus Christ. I love waffles. Can I get an amen? Anybody like waffles? I was just reading that waffles are pancakes with, with pockets for syrup. I mean, I use like a whole bottle of syrup on my waffle. But I love waffles. And, and so when, I, when the movie Shrek came out, you know, and Donkey, uh, I'm sure a lot of thought went into that name. And that's my favorite line from that movie because Don uh, Donkey says, in the morning, I'm making waffles. I'm like, yes, I like you. So you have this character of, of, of the talking donkey in Shrek. And I don't know if you know, but the, there's roots for this character in Scripture. If you go into the book of Numbers, there's this incident where, where there's this king named Balak who doesn't like the fact that Israel's moving his way and he's scared of him. And so he calls upon this prophet named Balaam, Balak calls Balaam, and says, hey, I want you to curse them. I want you to curse those people. And so as, as Balaam gets onto his donkey, or his mule, or, or King James Version calls it his ass, and he starts riding to a place where he can condemn Israel, then it says that an angel stood in his way. And, he, and here's the passage. It says... No. <laughs> That's not the passage. That's the donkey. It says, But God was angry because he was going, that Balaam was going to curse Israel. And the angel of the Lord stood in his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. When the donkey, the donkey, when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, then the donkey turned off from the way and went into the field. But Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the way. Then the angel of the Lord stood in the narrow path of the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed herself to the wall and then pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in the narrow place where there was no way to turn to the right or the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, again, the donkey saw the angel, not Balaam, she lay down under Balaam. Balaam gets angry, and he struck the donkey with a stick. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, and this is the donkey now, turning around, looking at Balaam, what did I do to you? That you have struck me these three times. I would love to see the look on Balaam's face when he says this. <laughs> Balaam looks and he answers the donkey. I think I would, I don't know what I would do, but... I, he says, because you've made a mockery of me. If there had been a sword in my hand, it would have killed you by now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you've ridden all your life to this day? Have I ever been accustomed to do so to you? He said, uh, no. 
And then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed all the way to the ground. Here's the thing. There was a message. God had a message for Balaam. He had to use a mule to get the message across to a prophet. He had to use a donkey and make the donkey talk to get the message across to the prophet. So if you think I'm not good at this, you're better than a donkey. <laughs> you understand it better than a mule. It's God's message. It's not yours. Yeah, you might mess it up, but God will take it. I've messed up many sermons and somebody has gotten something good out of it. And it's God's message. It's not mine. It's God's message. It's not yours. He will fix it. He doesn't need PR. You don't need to be worried about preening it up. You just need to share the message. And here's my one uh, closing remark with this. Because in the Old Testament, there was what was called a drink offering. They just basically took a, a, a drink to the altar and they poured it out onto the altar. What happens when we, we get done with our cup and we look into our... We always look in the cup. We go to take a drink, realize it's empty, and then we look in the cup and, oh, it's empty. We need to look into our cup. Every one of us needs to, to, to ask some questions and look into our cup because if we're offering, if we're wanting to make an offering to God and pour this out on the altar and, and, and share the good news of Jesus Christ, you better look in your cup. Do you understand the good news of Jesus Christ? Do you feel the good news of Jesus Christ? Do you, do you understand how great this God is that we serve? Or do you get excited when you think about this God? When you see somebody who's broken, do you think, Oh my, I know the answer to that. I know who can help you. I know a place that you can go for eternity and not feel any more of those pains. If you're not feeling that excitement, then look into your own cup and understand... I need, to, I need to spend time in prayer. I need to work on my journey. I need to ask God. I need to, I need to focus on, on what the Bible tells me about Him. Because if we're not feeling that need and that draw to share with others, then, then we need to, to make sure we're getting the gospel. That we understand the good news. Pray with me. Our dear Father in heaven, Lord, you are amazing. Lord, the, the grace that you give us is, is amazing. The mercy is, is, is beyond our comprehension. How great you are, God. How wonderful you are. How beautiful you are. And Lord, I pray that that would just, that message would sink into our hearts. Not, not a guilt about going out and telling others. Not a, not a, not a, not a commandment to go out and tell others, but the love of you would just invade our hearts and take over because if that love happens, we can't help but tell others about your beauty and your majesty. Lord, may every one of us feel your love and your presence. And may we lean upon each other as we do this because this is a, this is a journey. Lord, we want to be messengers. We want to be the messengers of your good news. With our mouths, with our lives, with our actions, with our voices, with, with everything that's in us. Lord, we pray your blessing upon us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.